thing here, but it is four o'clock and fifty seconds, so we will call the meeting to order. Mr. Boswell, Mr. Granger, here. Mr. Clee, here. Ms. Macbeth, here. Mr. Edwards, here. Mr. Schaller, here. So this is our um, work session on the capital improvement program, and um, I'll turn this over to Carolyn, our city manager here. Yes, City Manager Andrew Trivett will briefly go over the uh, sheets with you, and if you have any questions, I think you want to wait until after you finish or as you move along. Either one is fine with me. Okay. With that. Yes, good uh, afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Um, so today we want to do the annual review of the Capital Improvement Plan and get the Planning Commission's feedback on what is currently in design? Now, before we dig into it, I've got to preface the remarks with some notes on how this works, just to refresh your memory. So at this point in our budget process, very early, right? So what you're looking at is a draft that not even the city council has seen yet. This is purely the staff's working document right now. Um, so there's a lot of things in here that uh, both from a revenue and an expense side that the council has not said, yes, we're going to do that or not. So just keep that in mind, that this is purely structural at this point. Um, we followed this sim a similar process that we have in the past for putting this together with a round of, of staff meetings where we met with each department and got both their capital needs and their operational needs as we began to put together the budget. The big difference in where we are this year as opposed to every other year in the city's history is that we advanced our budget schedule by a full month. And the reason that we did that was because I wanted to try and have a good sense of where we were uh, on the budget before we left for holidays. And that we were, we were successful in that. We, we completed all of our department meetings and had some sense of what the expenses were going to be, as well as some good forecasts on revenues. And that allowed us for essentially an extra 30 days before we have to present a budget to the city council at the budget retreat and today, which allows us the time to make any changes that we might need in the operational budget or in the CIP to make it all balance. Now, one of the things that's different about that process, just since I've been the city manager is historically, we've not presented a completed budget to city council at the budget retreat, but last year we pretty much did. We presented a budget that was both balanced and, and ready for approval if they had chosen to. Um, and we hope to do that again this year because the process was very smooth and so we're hoping that it, it will go similarly. What had been a half day budget retreat only took about an hour and a half. And I'm not, I say that not to take away from the importance of the action, but to illustrate that we had really thought through everything that needed to be analyzed and presented it in a way that made it a lot more transparent for both the city council and the public to see what was presented both in the budget, but probably more importantly, what wasn't in the budget. And the CIP is a big piece of that. Uh, so this year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over a couple of things that we have done that changes the CIP sort of holistically, because you need to understand that to really comprehend what's being presented to you. So first and foremost, we began a conversation last year about how we talk about the city's reserve otherwise known as fund balance, and the city's reserve policy. The city's reserve policy adopted by council is that we will maintain at least 35% of our annual operating expense in reserve. And that is a very healthy reserve balance by all standards across the state. Okay, so if you compare to us in that regard, our reserve policy and what we're maintaining currently in reserve to other localities across the state, bigger, smaller, doesn't matter, you would find that our reserve is very, very healthy. Um, but what was difficult was the reserve was commingled. The general fund reserve was commingled with the balance of the CIP fund. And if you remember, at the end of the CIP sheets, which you have before you today, there was a tally of that reserve balance. And that's because all that money was in the same spot. It was all in the general fund and used for that purpose. And so when you sat down to do the calculation on what the city actually had available to spend, it got really complex when you started subtracting the restricted and, and reserved amounts from that unassigned fund balance, which makes up the reserve. 
Uh, and so what we did this year was we split the CIP and the general fund so that it was much more easy to see what that reserve balance is in the general fund, as well as what the fund balance is in the CIP and understand the difference between those two things. So the net effect of that is that when we finish putting together the CIP, if you look at that five-year schedule of expense, it'll be much easier to see where the CIP is relying on the general fund to support its operation, right? And that's a critical question because then the council has to answer where are we going to fund the balance of what's needed by the CIP? Are we going to cut projects, postpone projects, or increase revenue, either from the general fund as a transfer from fund balance, if it's healthy enough, or increase taxes or general revenue, right? Um, so hopefully that increases transparency. It's certainly made it easier for us to tell the story. The other change that we have made has just been in the last few days. And you, again, you can see that on the last page of the sheets that were presented. What has been done in the past, one way to think about our CIP, and it's one thing that makes us a little bit different than a lot of localities, is our CIP, for the most part, is pay-go. Meaning, we don't put projects in the budget until they're funded. And for the most part, those projects do not rely on new debt for completion, right? They are based on new revenue coming into the CIP, and the primary source of revenue to the CIP is sales tax and grants, not debt. Included in the CIP has always been a line, and it's just been a line, for school projects. The disadvantage to listing it that way was we've included that school calculation as part of our pay-go formula which makes it hard to prioritize those projects over municipal projects, right? Fire stations, police stations, libraries, whatever the case may be. Um, so this year what we've done is we've pulled that out and made it so that you can see not only that school project line, but the actual school new construction projects or major construction projects that make up our 10% commitment. The reason we did that, one of the reasons we did that was so that you could better track what year those projects were scheduled for. Because if you followed our CIP discussions in recent years, you know that the biggest driving factor in the CIP decisions has been when are we going to have to plan for new school construction. Whether that be a high school, an elementary school, or preschool facilities, it doesn't matter. They all have big price tags and all require us to move things around in the CIP so that we can fund it in a pay-go formula. So by separating this out, you can keep better track of where those projects are slated and also keep track of how this overall school budget impacts the pay-go nature of our CIP. All right, so now let's go back to talking about the projects generally. Um, and I'm not going to take a lot of your time today. I'm just going to try to highlight some of the important pieces of this, the ones that I think are most important probably to the Planning Commission. <clears throat> And so we'll start with the uh, street construction projects. Obviously, you all are familiar with this. Um, I want to highlight a boring one, probably, which is repaving. Uh, and then underneath that one is historic area streets. That's another change that occurred over the last year, year and a half, where historically the city has had an agreement with Colonial Williamsburg where they would maintain the streets inside the historic district. And in return for that, the city would give them annually our share of the um, called, uh, maintenance recovery money from VDOT related to just those segments of our city streets. So every year there's a calculation done by VDOT on lane miles maintained by the city and a certain portion of that can be attributed to the lane miles in the historic district and we would share that back. Now what's interesting about that calculation is it does not include Duke of Gloucester Street or streets that are generally closed to vehicular traffic. Hmm. So that's not a very large payment uh, and certainly does not meet the need of the maintenance required in the district, especially at this point in the life cycle of those streets. And if you've walked Duke of Gloucester, if you've driven Francis Street recently, you can tell it's time for some investment. So in street construction, or in historic area streets and in the repaving program, there is money programmed there 
to help us catch up on that maintenance, which is why you can see that number is a little bit bigger. Now we do rely on, in the repaving program, you'll see we've got 1.9 budgeted there, and that relies on a pretty hefty grant award that historically we've not always been successful at getting. And so what happens is at the end of the day, if we don't get that grant, we proceed with our share, the matching amount, which is about half, and then the rest gets postponed. So uh, hopefully that gives you some clarity there. We are hoping to do some significant historic area street improvements, both in the spring and in the fall. Um, of we're, 20 or of 21? Of uh, 20, mm. yes. The, um, Francis Street is one of the streets that we're, we're looking at doing repaving. I believe that would be a spring repavement. Hmm. And um, included in that, I've asked the Public Works Department to look deep into not only the actual pavement, which is what people sort of associate with repaving, but also the gutter pans on either side. And on Francis Street, that's a complex pre proposition because it's cobblestone. Hmm. And so if you've driven it you, and you pay attention to that cobblestone treatment, it also is in need of maintenance. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna be looking at how we can improve that aesthetic as well. Because I, what I really don't wanna do is pave that street and still drive it and think, man, this is not in great condition, primarily because of the way that gutter pan looks. So we're gonna be looking at that. I don't have an answer for you today as to how we're gonna get that done, but know that there is a budget here to help us accomplish that. Can you tell us about the road surface there? Will it be the same surfaces we're using throughout the city or is it a, a, a different surface? On Francis Street, it'll be traditional, what we call brownstone pavement. On Francis or Franklin? On Francis. Francis. On Duke of Gloucester Street, that has been the delay all these many years in resurfacing it, is what type of pavement to put down. Yeah. I will tell you that we have tested a product that is, I don't know how to describe it. It's not a brownstone pavement, meaning it has no black... Mm -hmm. course to it. it it is a sort of a it, it sort of looks like clear epoxy with that exposed aggregate inside it mm -hmm. but it's hard like pavement would be is this the one that's on franklin street yes okay the test patch on franklin street is an yeah. example of it so this budget is for that surface that's on right. gloucester street that's, that's right. great yes that's great um now the issue that we had was the test pavement of that did not hold up to the summer heat because we were, had hoped to do the Duke of Gloucester treatment repavement mm -hmm. this past fiscal year and couldn't do it because of that. Yeah. Um, but we've worked with the contractor and have a revised version of that that we're mm -hmm. testing now. Yeah. And if it's, that's why I say the fall, because if yeah. it survives the heat of summer, then we'll be able to proceed. But we acknowledge that, I, sh I should say, I certainly acknowledge, and I think the public works director does too, we've got to do something to Duke of Gloucester Street. Mm even if that is a traditional pavement. Mm -hmm. Because as it stands right now, it, it's just not, not only does it not look good, but in some areas it's just not safe. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's time to take a step. And where will the transition be between that surface and the more conventional, assuming that, the, that we, do get, we do use the, um, whatever it's called, the epoxy aggregate mix? I think it's, I think it's actually called heliocol. Don't ask me to spell it. Well, the H word. I can barely pronounce it. Right. Well, there'll, there'll be a transition between that and right. conventional paving. Will that happen at, at Francis? Will that happen at Duke of Gloucester? In other words, does it run on the north-south streets as well and Nicholson? Right now, the plan is only to do Duke of Gloucester Street with that treatment, mm. all the way to Merchant Square. Uh -huh. But the um, possible expansion of it to the other streets that are not traditionally open to vehicular traffic is 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 there yeah we just it's too early to tell okay I think it'd be great if we could continue it right up to Nicholson just because sure that really feels yeah. much more part of the consistency the in that treatment would help delineate the area absolutely that's how I see it too I think um, it would help people understand where they were uh, sure. as well sure we just have to acknowledge that 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 product is expensive. more expensive than traditional pavement yeah understood. Um, but it is doable fragile as well I don't think it is. I think once they perfected the formula, um, because yeah. what happened, this is probably more technical than you wanted to know, there's a softener that has to go into that epoxy. And if you add too much, when it, the heat gets up there, it breaks down and it becomes sticky. And that's what happened this past summer. 
Um, you should go see it on Franklin Street. It really looks. It's good. very attractive. It really looks oh, great. Franklin Street. Very houses. attractive. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so I think if we can get the the yeah, hardener issue addressed, it's going to be an excellent solution that yeah, most people. I'm not going to say all, but most people are probably going to like. Oh, I think that's right. Yeah, I agree. I'm. I'm sorry for asking a, a really basic <laughs> question here, but I assume that they're also testing it with. Um, the effects of the uh, horses' byproducts? Right. Yes. Okay. I mean, the, most roads don't get that nowadays. So, right. One of the reasons that they put it over on Franklin is that's where the, the horse and carriages go down because it was, in addition to the horse exhaust, it was also the, the iron or the, the iron wheels that also uh, okay. kind of degrade a conventional right. surface. Okay. So it's held, held up to both of those things. That's really the well. biggest concern. Um, yeah. But also, I think to Mr. Granger's point is you, you – you have to collect those droppings somehow, and they right now they do it with like a snow shovel. Mm -hmm. And when you come down on that helio coil with that sharp edge of the shovel, what mm -hmm. will happen? Um, so I, I will tell you, I'm not a fan of the horses' um, residual effects on the street. And so I think this opens the door for a conversation about how to treat that differently. Um, and I know that that brings the whole conversation about how that diminishes the historic experience. Um, but I think that's a conversation worth having. Um, so they'll tell you in the fife and drum that it's perfectly natural. You just stomp right through it. Stomp right through it. Exactly. It's really fine. <laughs> Cleans up real nice. Nothing but grass and water. That's right. You know, I used to say that I didn't think anybody actually came to Colonial Williamsburg for the horse manure, and it was sort of a running joke. And my wife and I were walking on um, the around the palace there one day, and there was a family taking pictures with it. <laughs> she said, you know, now, Drew, you can't say that anymore. <laughs> I said, I guess you're right. I can't say that anymore. Uh, so it was funny. All right, so that's the repaving project. Um, Capital Landing Road, I'm going to take those together. There's the Capital Landing Road bypass, road intersection improvement, and then down below it under corridor enhancement is Capital Landing Road redesign. Um, we have taken, just in the last few days, a major step forward on that project. Uh, as you know, that involves both state and federal funding, which lengthens the process between getting the project approved by the city council and then getting it approved so that we can start the work by both VDOT and the federal government. And we have done that, and so we had to kick off meeting with the consultant that was selected so many months ago now, uh, Kim Lee Horn, on that project. We had a very good beginning to the project where we discussed how we would move forward to include key points of stakeholder input, um, both at the city staff level but also from the public. And so that process will include two meetings at least on the corridor for the community to come talk about what that road should look like in the future. Uh, because with the amount of money that we have available to work on it, we have the capability of completely redefining that corridor in a very different way. And we need to think through very carefully what the future is for the corridor, not just from the standpoint of development on the corridor, but also in terms of development at either end so that the street in between is capable of handling it. Um, so, you know, we toyed with the idea probably three years ago now of what we popularly call a road diet for that street and before we take that very serious step we need to be certain that the development potentials on either end support that decision um, so i think that as we go through the process of developing some different concepts of design one flow of conversation will be around is there a hybrid position between the very suburban corridor that we have now and that traditional Main Street road diet that we had envisioned three years ago. And, you know, I, I think that will represent some compromise and position that will ultimately benefit the city. Um, I don't understate the importance of this project, and I hope you all realize it. I'm sure that you do, because we've got the opportunity here to create a real gateway to the city uh, where one has been traditionally absent. Uh, with about six million dollars to spend on a road project there's a lot of potential there for new facilities to include greenways and linear parks that could be enjoyed but also uh, aesthetic improvements like uh, removing the overground wires the utility services which really do a lot to enhance the visual appearance as you enter the city do any of those uh, considerations involve widening capital landing road or would it keep the same footprint that it has now 
Cabinet Landing Road as it stands has a very wide right of way in mm -hmm. most spots. And so just about anything we would envision would fit in the right of way we already own. Great. Um, I don't think that we see, I'm just, I'm speaking from the hip here, but I don't, I don't see any opportunity for us to make more pavement. Yeah. Great. I think if anything, it gets, it gets lessened. <laughs> um, but more likely, I think the outcome is a better use of the space that's there now. Do you, the intersection of Mary Mac trail and, Capital Landing will also be redesigned? Yes, that's the start of the project, okay. right there at that triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and then the city owns that land. Right. And that's where I say we've got the greatest potential for sort of an impacting gateway feature. Does it include any connection, pedestrian connection between Merrimack Trail and Capital Landing Road? Because that is an ongoing problem. Yes, it's it will. I mean, that's difficult to do because of the private property owners, but at and least on that ravine. end. And the ravine, which is also part of this. <laughs> the ravine, exactly. But on that end, I think it is doable and, and something we'll focus on. I, I mean, as we get closer to the public meetings, it, this process begins with sort of a visioning session with just the staff, but then moves into a public piece very quickly. I'm sure the Planning Commission will participate and help us encourage people to share their opinions on what should be and really help us direct the conversation away from what I would consider the immediate future and try to look long term because you're, you're talking about a road project that won't be repeated for a great many years. And it's a road project that we've been talking about for 20 years, it seems like, you know, yes. in some ways, right. you know. Yes. And in that period of time is also when the bypass has been built out. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just as you were talking, I'm thinking, like, when was the last time that I actually got off the highway at that exit and came in to town that way? And it's been years uh, because you hit one, depending on which direction you're coming, you hit the bypass and you fly in from a different direction. I mean, have you been monitoring, like, the, you know, the, the road usage over yes. this time and the consistency yeah. or the drop or, or what? I mean, obviously population needs to yep. be a cross tab in those numbers and how you interpret them, sure. but it seems like, I think we need to do something there to make that area different, but the idea that it is the gateway, which is sort of a phrasing that keeps on coming up, I think it seems like much less the gateway. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, if you looked at the, the traffic data, you would see a decrease from the time that the bypass was built. And I think that's your point, um, but I do think that as conversations sort of unfold regarding Colonel Williamsburg's use of property, there's there's a great many acres at the visitor center that are unused right now, um, both in parking and in uh, just unused space that could be turned into further development. And if it did, then we've got the opportunity to redirect that entrance. Um, and I, I think that it's a conversation that we have to have with our partners, William and Mary and Colonel Williamsburg. And that's part of the contract for Kimley Horn is to meet with those stakeholders. What I have said to those uh, stakeholders so far is we're about to spend $6 million redesigning this road and it would be a terrible shame if we did that without your input and without your recognizing the potential of creating a gateway to both of your facilities at the same time. And so I, I think we've got great potential here. I just don't want to miss it. All right, so let's see. Um, Montreal Avenue redesign, of course, you're familiar with that project. It's underway right now. Um, that includes, I'll skip down to the Monticello Avenue multi-use trail. The importance of the Monticello A Avenue multi-use trail, I think, is, is another one that really we, we can't overestimate, only because I think that when that project is done, the community and the region are going to start measuring bike facilities by that standard. And what I mean by that is we're putting in what will arguably be the best bike facility in the region um, when you consider both projects together, both the Monticello Avenue multi-use trail that goes from the intersection of Ironbound all the way to the education school and then continues on past the Midtown project as a cycle track, both being lit very different variations on the same idea of a bike path. I think it's going to be something that the community comes to expect from future bicycle projects. 
And so we're just going to have to be cognizant of that as we start designing things, which sort of leads us to another project on the list, which is the Strawberry Plains and John Tyler multi-use mm -hmm. trail. Um, you know, it, the multi-use trails, the bicycle facilities are going to become more and more important because you can look at all the data on the users and construction of those facilities and communities and the driver that it is on the economy. It's undeniable. It is a driver. Uh, people travel to use them, and the more connected they are, the better it is. So with the Strawberry Plains project, we have the potential to create a sizable portion of a loop that connects to that Monticello improvement and brings you right through to Jamestown, and then a future Jamestown project could bring you right into the heart of downtown, connecting to a Richmond Road project. And so now you've sort of got this square that could be a really landmark bicycle feature. If you take that concept and fold it into a discussion of the birthplace of America trail that's in discussion and has been, an extension of the Capitol trail all the way to Fort Monroe, those pieces of infrastructure could play a critical component of how we most cost effectively move that Capitol trail traffic to the birthplace of America trail through the city. Uh, because taking it right through the heart of the commercial corridor, while advantageous from the standpoint of having that traffic, is very cost prohibitive. Because in most cases, particularly along Richmond Road, you're talking about acquiring right of way. Um, and the same thing applies to the Newtown area, where right now the Capitol Trail expansion is planned. And the biggest hurdle to that is, of course, acquiring the right of way from those landowners and navigating the 199 interchange. Where does the Capitol Trail come into Newtown? Well, would it come into Newtown? That's the plan right now on the, the Where does it? Map. I'm just trying to imagine where it connects up. I can't. Um. So right now it terminates um, in the vicinity of, I think, Jamestown High. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so it connects and kind of cuts over to Monticello and comes right up by. It just keeps coming up. It five. comes right up by Settlers Village I and see. then Newtown, uh, it, uh, either over or under the 199 interchange there. And that's in the planning stages? Well, it's designed. I mean, it's not designed. It's, it's on the roadmap. Gotcha. of how they would like to see that occur. Yeah, um, I see. There's alternate courses identified, you know, yeah. and it ultimately comes down to what can be done first. Yeah. And, of course, that's driven by expense. Yeah. As we think about, and I know we talked about this, I think, even last year, as we think about, I think, uh, Strawberry Plains and John Tyler, that section of it, um, I, I, I would like to see that remain a pretty high priority um, because I drive that a lot. And it's a 45 mile an hour road that there's often people walking in the shoulder. Um, there's uh, kids that could walk and do currently bike uh, along the shoulder to get to Berkeley um, from Strawberry Plains developments. So it's just a very busy street that, in addition to being a nice amenity for people who want to ride their bikes all around town, it could also become an important part of the transportation infrastructure for people that live um, on either side of Strawberry Plains um, for getting to school, but also for getting to Newtown. And, um, other parts of town, so uh, that that to me is is um, sort of puts that in a separate category from the, just the amenity. I take your point entirely. This would be a great amenity, but in terms of thinking about priorities, to me that that's a higher one because it has an additional benefit, which is a um, would be an important part of the transportation infrastructure that would make things a little safer uh, for people. And the multi-use trail aspect of Monticello and Strawberry Plains and John Tyler, I mean. Yes, it can be, I, mean, I, I can see, you know, or some development hat on or something like that, that this can be part of this other focus, but this also is part of our sidewalk infrastructure. Right. And what for me yeah. is really attractive um, is that a lot of the older neighborhoods that are fortunate enough to have sidewalks and, you know, Jamestown Road area where I live does have sidewalks on Jamestown Road, but they're really narrow. I mean, and so, Not you know, these multi-use trails are also inviting in that they are wide enough to have, bikes and people, but you can also really encourage a lot of like kids walking to school because it's yeah. a big enough throughput, you know, I mean, yeah. we're going back and forth on Jamestown to the uh, farmer's market, it's like, okay, single file, another family's coming at you, you know, yeah, <laughs> sure. you can't pass many people the same. That's also a nice feature of that. So the 30000 is for design, planning? Um, $30,000 is purely for a study, a study, to look at how this would be done, and the reason for that is because this is a complex proposition. Mm -hmm because of the nature of that road through there. You know, mm. if you think about Strawberry Plains, mm. one side is James City County, one side is the city, and the yeah. road belongs to VDOT. 
mm -hmm. uh, which means there are right of way issues that we don't have anywhere else in the city. Yeah. And so we need a study to both tell us what the appropriate design would be mm. and how to navigate that issue with James City County as well as VDOT. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, Lafayette Street con reconstruction, that was one that we've talked about a couple different times. You know, it's, it's in and out year, but it's probably one that needs to be talked about because it does impact the viability long-term of the CIP. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to the, the end of the pages here. But um, it would be helpful to have the Planning Commission's input on how you see the importance of that project. Um, so that is a redesign of Lafayette Street akin to what happened on, this is not a good example, but it's an example, York Street, um, where you know we go in there and we try to improve the width, improve the facilities for the pedestrians, bury the, the utilities, um, an expensive proposition to be sure, and sort of would like to get the Planning Commission's opinion on the importance of that. I would say it's pretty high. Um, the, the car count that's, that's running down there is pretty drastic, I, you know, what I can tell, and, and the wires are hideous and the poles are all at an angle and the sidewalks are crooked. And so I'm, uh, there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really teeny. Narrow. Um, Very narrow. So I'm, I'm, I guess, disappointed to see it's uh, all the way back in 2025 and uh, 2024. So. I, that seems like a big one to me because I think we have more cars on Lafayette Street nowadays than we do on Richmond Road. Um, and I think in previous years we've sort of <clears throat> we've observed that it would be useful to tie it to any redevelopment of the um, uh, what was the hotel? Um, Super Eight. The, the yeah, Super, Super Eight. Eight. Right. Yeah. So you know to sort of touch it once we're going to be having to dig up trenching for new water lines or whatever, it'd be best to just do everything all at once. So um, I presume the reason for deferring it that long is is to kind of um, allow that to gather some momentum and see what's going to happen with that parcel, or is that really just strategic? Is it just to get it's it? It's really twofold. Number uh -huh. one is to combine it with the vision for the intersection, which is really uh -huh. what you're driving at there at Richmond Road yeah. and Lafayette. Yeah. Um, but also, it's funding related because you know we fund most of our major road projects. Is most fair? I'm not sure. But we fund a lot of our major road projects through smart scale applications or other VDOT funding. And the way smart, smart scale works is they sort of meet and award funds for future years. And that's where we are in that project's award cycle. So uh, that's why it's so far out. Mm. I, I would think that redoing the road uh, will help and in inspire uh, redevelopment of the Super 8 project. I mean, if, if the all, all the stuff is there so that it's uh, prepared and, and ready and we've got a, a nice looking corridor, it would probably make it easier to get somebody in there to do it. Um, and if we're serious about the arts district, from the books for a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> something we need to do. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try not to talk about all of them and it's starting to seem like I am, but Newport Avenue sidewalks, that is in response to some citizens that have complained about speeding and traffic volume as it relates to sort of, I think Google directing people to take that route. Oh, the cut through uh, area. Right, and, and, and so we, have, we don't have a lot of control over the Google routing, just so <laughs> everybody listening can hear that. We get a lot of complaints about it and have very little control over it. Well, um, parking on both sides of the street's a problem on that street, sure. as well as Griffin. And if you're going to do Newport, we should look at Griffin as well, because they don't have a sidewalk either. Right. Mm. Right, right, you're right. And it can connect them both to the college. Get up to James. So get working. Up to Jamestown Road. Working with the residents of Newport, we put this in the CIP and are hoping to fund a project there that will help. Could be a first step, Mr. Edward. And so that's the only, that's the only discrete sidewalk. I mean, I already have said that these multi-use trails are actually multi-modal, mm -hmm. you know, they are sidewalks. Um, the only um, public comment that we received at our hearing last week 
was from someone who lives in the Oaks mm. um, and about the connectivity of sidewalks <coughs> and, and street lighting um, from College Creek Park, you know, out to the city line or at least out to the entrance of the Oaks is, in, and I guess part of it is that obviously that was the, the public comment that we received in Previous years, there's always been more of a laundry list of sidewalks, even if they were way out in the fiscals. Is there any way, excuse me, there's a couple of years, let me take from this side, there's a couple of fiscal years where there's nothing in the multi-use paths or sidewalks. Are, you know, what, what is the rank order of potentials hmm. in those years, or is, is that something that- Oh, well, one of the things is- flag, one of, flagpole or something. Sure, it's a great question. I think one of the things that will happen is Strawberry Plains will expand next year. Uh, or next fiscal year, after we've done the study and have a better concept of cost there, that will expand that one out, and you'll start to see numbers filled in in the next sequential years for the completion of that project. Um, but I think your point is, is excellent about the Oaks. We have received that concern. We're working on a plan now. Um, Should that plan include going all the way to 199 because the property that's uh, mm. The vacant property across from the Oaks has been for sale forever. I don't know if it's either we're thinking a park or we're thinking development, but sure. a sidewalk would it's either way. Right. I think it. My answer is, it doesn't need to go all the way to 199 because well, I don't least. think we're encouraging okay. pedestrians on 199. But I think <laughs> access to that property. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And you know we've got sidewalk now to the city's College Creek Park. So looking at a meaningful way of connecting that forward is, is important. Um, that's something we should look at. I don't know that we can, it may be difficult to fit that into the five-year plan, but it is possible that we identify some funding to consider it in the same way that we're doing Strawberry Plains at some future year. And there's two pieces to that issue. One is the sidewalk, and one is streetlights. There, when, once you hit the you know, the entrance to Port Anne, streetlights go away. And so, I mean, I think that if we, there's you know a two lane road, there's bike lanes. Some of the the white striping for some parts of that is, is getting pretty dim at this point. But I mean, there's there's that space. If you if those bike lanes are, I think, are more brightly delineated. But it's park is all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you really know that you're in the country right there. Yeah. You know, the, the streetlights just go. So, I mean, what's, where do, I mean, streetlights are, again, one of these, pay for them, but we, they're on VDOT up right away, or, I mean, they're, they're also a conjoined issue. Is that correct? I mean, uh, not, not in every case. I mean, we, we pay for them uh, to be installed, and then Dominion helps us with maintenance. Um, but I think that, and I've been having a conversation with Public Works about the design of street lighting, period, because I personally don't like the look of the tall cobra head lights, which is sort of the traditional version. And we don't have the traditional version because in most communities that tall cobra head light that overhangs the roadway on one side or the other is just a silver sort of aluminum looking pole. And here we at least paint them green. But I think that, you know, as we look to add new lighting infrastructure. I'm encouraging Public Works to consider a better design street element, um, you know, at least a fluted pole, a black would be, I think, more acceptable. Um, so those are conversations that'll be had and, and something that we'll be pushing forward to ARB for some input, um, because I do think that that's somewhere that we need to, we need to change how we design street lighting. I, it always amazes me the impact that street lighting choices have on the aesthetics of a corridor. I mean, it, it seems sort of non-existent only because those cobra heads are so tall, but if you pull that down to a pedestrian scale and make it something attractive, it's a fairly minuscule investment that completely changes the look and the feel mm -hmm. of that street. I've mentioned it a couple of times in passing. Um, Jeff and I live in Walnut Hills, and the S-curve going up Milnick Road um, I wish we could find a better way to get pedestrians up that road that wouldn't force cars into oncoming traffic. Um, it's, there are a ton of people who walk up that road, and I don't know that I necessarily want to encourage more people to walk up that road, and I'm certainly not a fan of a sidewalk all the way along Milnack, but, you know, if, if we could get them from Jamestown 
up through the S curve and then the end, the beginning of a trail into College Woods closer to the S curve because what they're doing is they're coming up the S curve and then about halfway down Mill Neck there's a, a gated entrance to the walking trails mm -hmm. and so if there was if the trail started closer to the S curve which is all on college property but if there was a safe way to get them up that S curve so the cars aren't going into oncoming traffic um, because there's a pedestrian coming it's a uh, it's a miracle nobody's been seriously hurt yet uh, okay. so you know it would do it no left turn onto Jamestown Road. <laughs> <laughs> Eliminate the cut through. I mean, I don't go that way anymore for that very reason. Whether it's the deer or the people, I just don't. I go out by the stoplight. But I'm not suggesting it. Um, <laughs> but it's an easy fix. Cut. I wanted to do it that way. That would cut down on the, the people cutting through instead of going people, to the stoplight. People use that as a cut through? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. From yeah. John Tyler to that yes. one? Right. Really? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. A lot. Yeah. It's pretty. It is pretty. <laughs> it's pretty and, and, and the... Okay, so they're not doing it for speed. No. Well, okay. Oh, yeah, no, they're doing, it for, they're doing it for speed because they get hung up at the Walsingham light. Right. Um, in the mornings, that the traffic light at, at Walsingham ties them up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, some mornings. It's gotten a lot better, but... I know. I don't, I don't take that street for that very reason. I mean, it's not designed for that. <laughs> No. I have to go slower. To, I mean, it just, and it's, it's and it's just counterintuitive to me. But a that's $200 speeding at. fine on top of it. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Which I would probably get, so I, don't, <laughs> I won't do that. But I, I, that's a, uh, thank you for the suggestion. We'll, we'll take that back and consider it. I, 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 don't, I can't promise it'll make its way into the CIP this year, but thanks for bringing it up because I was not aware that that was a problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then we stormwater management. Uh, Sorry, before we jump into stormwater, I wanted to bring up something that was on the memo from us last year, which and it's something we had a long conversation about last year, which is Merrimack Trail and mm -hmm. the lack of sidewalks on both sides, as yeah. well as there's really no traffic calming, even though, you know, there's, there's in theory a low speed limit on the road, but no one really seems to obey it. And mm -hmm. um, some of it's personal experience from when I lived over there, but even still driving that way it seems like you know there's one thing that that Andy already mentioned which is this connection from Merrimack to Capitol Landing and obviously that's a longer term sort of in line with redoing Capitol Landing but I, I think it would be good to at least similar to what what we see here for our Strawberry Plains point mm -hmm. it is even if it's just some money to study, study what we it. can do yeah. to mm -hmm. to calm traffic a little bit and to improve pedestrian and bicycle access along Merrimack Trail. I think that would be nice. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, I think that's hear what the idea. rest of the commission has to say too. But yeah, absolutely. A lot of people walk up to the shopping center. From oh. I think yeah. you see people with buggies trying to get around uh, Colonial Parkway where the sidewalk actually sort of ceases to exist you know, right on the road. It'd be dangerous and people do drive too fast. For sure. Yeah. And, and well, it, I think it used to be absolutely out of the question. I mean, we now have um, speed bumps and humps in different parts of town. Sure. You know, the, the North Mount Henry Street has them, and Skip also in Skipwith, there's a couple. So, I mean, yeah. the, the traffic calming um, seemed to me that it would be a much lower cost item than the study, and could be done faster. Right. You I know, mean, than, yeah. than the study on a sidewalk and then getting the right of ways and then pouring a trail or a sidewalk or something like that, which would be nice sure. to have. And, but if you could do that. Yes, yeah. and even, yeah, I, again, not knowing the cost of, yeah. but yeah, perhaps it would be worth putting these in sort of traffic, known traffic calming things as well as maybe some, some crosswalks with the little, you know, lighted flashing man. Again, not knowing how expensive these are. You obviously know that better than I do. Perhaps they're not as cheap as I would think, but they're not. Or even, okay, <laughs> or even striping in a crosswalk with just a traditional sign uh, could be good and at least force drivers to recognize that it is, like you said, a very active pedestrian road for people going from the apartments to Food Lion to Second Street to wherever. Yeah. Right, and, and I, to me this is sort of like, you know, puzzle the riches that we have in other parts of the city of crosswalks and sidewalks that I have had drivers say to me that in places where there aren't crosswalks that it's illegal to be walking and, and crossing so you basically get what you deserve kind of thing. and I'm like sure. that's not the rules of the road that I know you know um, but um, yeah I, I totally sure. agree. Great. 
I think that's a good suggestion. Um, I like the idea of putting some study money in because okay. it helps us better phase the cost of doing the improvement. Sure. I'll tell you, I'm not a fan of speed humps, speed bumps, either one. Um, they make snow removal complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. They also increase maintenance costs. Uh, they also increase claims on the city for damage to vehicles. Um, and generally, the citizenry who want them once they're installed don't like them. Um, and so I think I would rather go the route of planning for more longer term traffic calming through sidewalks, narrowing the street, whatever we need to do there. Um, on the crosswalk issue, the one thing I would point out to the Planning Commission, I'm sure you've thought about it already, it's something we say a lot, is we try to avoid putting in sidewalks just everywhere because it implies safety that's not necessarily there. And so the general rule is you want an intersection for a crosswalk because that's where you get the greatest safety as opposed to just a long straight stretch with a sidewalk with a crosswalk. Mm -hmm. That's almost a recipe for disaster because the pedestrian thinks, oh, I'm safe and steps right out into traffic and traffic can't stop. Sure. Um, so Especially on Richmond Road where we allow parking right up against right. the side. And, you know, right. Buddy walks out from a car. They're in a crosswalk, but you haven't seen them until they're in the middle of the road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're pretty careful with that, um, but we'll look at all of that in sure. the process. Uh, thanks for reminding us. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so stormwater management, uh, in the recent years, we've increased those budgets because of stormwater needs at Capitol Landing Road, Walnut Hills, and at Route 143. These are areas where we have outfalls that over the years have just eroded away to the point that we need to take action. Hmm. Um, a lot of this is on private property in terms of impact. Um, and most cases, the property owners themselves have brought it to our attention. And so we've applied for some stormwater grants. We didn't get one last year that we were hoping to get to help with Capital Landing Road. Uh, we will apply again and hope that we are successful. Each time that we apply, we are putting away a little bit of money as a match for that grant. And so eventually we'll have enough on our own to pay go complete those improvements. So then the next page, we start with facilities and we look at recreation, culture, and open space. And we sort of group these improvements in the parks and recreation under the three parks that we have, or the three major facilities that we have, um, Waller Mill, Kiwanis, and the Quarter Path Rec Center. Um, if you look at what's planned, you'll see that a lot of what is described are sort of general maintenance issues and minor upgrades. There is not a lot of major construction planned. That's particularly true for Quarter Path Rec Center because the future of that facility is a little bit uncertain as we continue to have the conversation about the need to increase available space for programming there and how that relates to the construction of a regional field house. Because what we wouldn't want to do is expand the Quarter Path Rec Center only then turn around and build a regional facility that meets that need anyway. Um, so we've slowly, we've, we've slowed down that conversation and folded it into that regional discussion. And if you followed that, you know that there's money committed from the Tourism Development Fund mm -hmm. to facilitate that. I sent out invitations to the counties uh, Friday to participate in the work associated with the regional field house concept. Um, and I, I'm anticipating that we'll start that work very soon in terms of the initial discussions of programming from the locality side. Because one of the things that we do here that I think is a tremendous advantage is we share the load for meeting the parks and recreation demand. So the city tries not to offer programming that's offered by James City County and vice versa. And as we plan for new facilities, we don't want to overlap each other. And so as we start to think about a regional design, we need to have a conversation with James City County and York County about what their needs are in the future for, for their parks recreation programs so that we can design that into the facility. Um, so that, that conversation is happening. On the Kiwanis Park side, the big project is, of course, completion of the fourth lighted field, which is, from which the is tourism development another fund. project that was funded through Tourism Development Fund. So that project will start in, I believe, the summer and carry through into the next fiscal year uh, for completion. So um, it's not shown here because that money will actually come from Tourism Development Fund and be expended in the current fiscal year. Yeah, so that was one of my questions in terms of, since I'm in the weeds with that committee assignment as well, is like, 
it, are those grants being rolled into these capital revenue? So I didn't see that there, and then they're inputted, or they're just kept, being kept separate? In the, in the final version of the CIP, we will show the projects here. Um, if they're going to be pushed out into that next fiscal year, as the Kiwanis Park project will, and then you'll see a revenue at the top from the Tourism Development Fund equal to that amount. So then we move on into public safety, and obviously we've got two big projects there that are still underway. The first one is the fire station renovation. So that's a project where we bonded uh, an amount of money designed to construct or redesign the existing fire station. And where we landed as a, as a city was to look at doing both options, building a second station and renovating the existing station to a lesser degree. And we're still working toward that end. Um, with the new fire chief, he wanted us to do a little bit more programming on what that second station would look like and need to serve as before we issued an RFP for construction. And that will help us to be sure, certain that the costs that we get through the RFP process are more accurate. And so we agreed to do that and that slowed us down by a collection of months uh, in terms of issuing the RFP. Uh, but we are moving ahead with it. <clears throat> Renovation and the building of the new one being sort of simultaneous or? I'm sorry? Would it be a simultaneous uh, action renewing the yeah. fire station here and building a new one? That's the plan right now. And we think that by doing that at the same time, we'll get the best response from the RFP process because it's a larger project. Had to postpone destruction of the DMV? No, that, that unrelated, unrelated. Unrelated? Okay. Yeah, um, we did discuss postponing the, the demolition at the DMV property as a result of funding the demolition of 3030 Richmond Road, which was very expensive. And so we sort of prioritized where the nuisance, public nuisance, the attractive nuisance, if you will, yeah. to the community was. And it seemed like it was 3030 Richmond Road. The DMV property is pretty self-contained. Um, we've got an agreement right now with, um, what's the acronym for the transit? No, HRT. Yeah, HRT, yeah. HRT, sorry, <laughs> I had a moment there. HRT to allow for shipyard employees to park at the DMV property mm -hmm. and take HRT to the shipyard because they have a very, they have a significant parking problem. Mm -hmm. And so we worked with them to solve that problem. They were parking in our downtown and a few people still are, which complicates not only people parking for the transit center, but also our employees and visitors at the municipal center, like today, I think there were three spaces open at one point in our entire parking lot. Hmm. Um, and part of that is because of the shipyard employees. Um, so it's getting some use, there are people so there. It's like a, a minivan or a, a small bus or something that picks them up and takes them down to the sh shipyard. They catch HRT at the transit oh, center. Oh, an actual HRT. Oh, yes, oh. yeah, it's an actual HRT bus, it's a shuttle, it's a contract arrangement with the shipyard. Um, and we're happy to help accommodate them, but we, we've got to get them transitioned out of our municipal parking lot because there's just not enough space for everybody. But the thing that that does for the DMV property is it keeps it utilized, uh, even though the stores are all vacant, and it keeps people there, keeps it under sort of observation. So it seemed like a lesser priority. Mm -hmm. I know that that's not something that the residents out on Capilano Arena want to hear, but we did take some steps to improve and beautify that, that space, and they were very appreciative of that. Um, at this point, we've not decided to delay the DMV project because we actually applied for a grant for 3030 Richmond Road. Hopefully, we'll receive that grant and that will reduce our costs there, which will allow us to go back to the original plan for demolition. <coughs> so then on the police station, that's a conversation that has um, sort of grown. We started out looking at a renovation of the police station and are now considering whether or not that's a smart investment given the age and condition of the police station. I think that most people would agree that the smarter investment would be to look at replacement. And so we're gonna be having a conversation with city council about what that would look like and how we might accomplish it and get some direction. And if so, that will change that project's both completion date as well as budget. Um, so that's one of those projects that is, is moving along, but in a different fashion than we had originally envisioned. Does replacement um, mean new site? Could be, could be. 
Um, it's very difficult to think about how we would replace it in its existing location right. and still function the police uh, as a police department yeah. without completely inconveniencing their operation right. yeah. for disrupting a long period of time. Right. Reduce the parking space. Plus, I think that, you know, and, and we can skip ahead, as we talk about the library, mm -hmm. uh, that police station's location makes it difficult to really vision what's possible with a new library. Mm. Um, if you didn't have the police station in that location, then the sky's the limit, as they say, in terms of what you can do with the library, particularly as it relates to the library's function to this building. Mm -hmm. um, if the police station weren't there, there's a lot of possibility for things like underground parking mm -hmm. and a physical connection that's meaningful to the Stryker Center mm -hmm. so that now you have grown the library in a way that really wasn't envisioned when you start, when you just talk about renovating or rebuilding on the existing library site. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's a lot of advantages into considering moving the police station somewhere else. Obviously, because of our call volume and the nature of the city, we'll still be looking at downtown. Mm. Okay, so then uh, under equipment, I mean, there's not a whole lot there to discuss at the Planning Commission. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory. A lot of the theme of, well, if you, if you read last year's budget and you read the, the budget message that I wrote, you noticed that I, I gave it a theme of renewal. And this year's budget, I can't tell you what the theme will be because we don't have it done yet, but it feels like we are moving in the direction of what I would consider modernization and preparing for the future. Um, so there's going to be a lot more conversation this year with the council about staffing, uh, as well as these new facilities, the library, the fire station, and the police station. And that preps us for the next 50 years of public service, at least in the, in the public safety sector. So these equipment needs are part of that modernization. Um, even on the operating side of the budget, we've spent a great deal of capital investing in upgrading bringing current processes and equipment all across government in Williamsburg. And the police department is one of those places that has needed a lot of that attention. And we've been pretty successful at it. And this CIP envisions continuing that investment. Parking study implementation. I'll pause and talk about that one just for a second because um, believe it or not, we continue to talk about parking almost daily. <laughs> um, we presented a roadmap to city council in 2017 of how to implement the parking study and we are still following that roadmap. Phase one is complete with the exception of we envisioned installing sensors in the parking spaces that would give us better occupancy data. Mm -hmm. We ran into difficulty finding a vendor that could provide us with a reliable product. And we talked to localities that were using them and they shared that concern with their existing in-street application. So we decided to push back from that. And we went with license plate readers, which has been a success in the garage, um, especially now that we're offering the app that has taken the pressure off of the pay stations, which seemed to be the only sticking point really toward the end of the garage conversation. Um, but we have now are in the process of negotiating a pilot program on Prince George Street. You may have noticed that in the last couple of weeks we added markings to delineate actual parking spaces mm. on what was just large swaths of parking on the street side. Uh, the reason that we've done that is because we have a company that we're partnering with or hope to partner with that will come and install sensors at their expense and run a pilot program for about four months to demonstrate that their product can, in fact, do what we need to do and do it in the months that we might expect snow. I mean, I'm not wishing snow on anybody, but if we did get a snow in late February after having installed the sensors, it would give us a good idea of whether or not they can withstand the snow plow. Um, they've installed them in communities that have a lot more snow than we do and they're functioning fine. In Canada, they have sensors that are broadcasting accurately even under four inches of snowpack. Um, so I, I think it, I'm, I'm encouraged by it. And the fact that the company is willing to come do this at their expense 
we're only going to pay travel and some minor expenses in the process uh, demonstrates their commitment to the technology. And if they do that, then we get back to the convenience items that we wanted to offer the community in terms of being able to see occupancy before you leave the house. But also, I don't know if you've looked at cars recently, but if you have, more and more cars in their interface are offering a um, navigate to parking option. And so what it does, it goes out and finds parking and directs you to it. And if we had the availability of data of open parking spaces, it would take you right to the open parking space. Um, so that's, that's what I would consider future-proofing if it works. Um, and so we're optimistic that that's going to be a good product for us in the end. So hopefully in the next month or so, you'll see the, the company here installing the sensors and then beginning that four-month test. So we jumped right over the line item that's right before parking <laughs> implementation. New parking garage with $4 million in fiscal year 2021. Right. <laughs> Did you want me to say more than right? <laughs> Um, I'll give you a pass. You know, you have a whole pass. No, no, it's uh, <laughs> but so as we've talked about <laughs> downtown, the potential of a new library, which we'll talk about when we get there, the possibility of a new police station downtown. It's impossible to address those projects correctly and not talk about parking. And so while we're not saying we have a site or a solution, we are saying we need to budget for a parking option to accommodate those uses. And so that's why we've put that in there. So that's a placeholder. Yeah. For exactly. exactly. For I think what you could probably expect is that that parking garage number in 22 probably gets moved out because I really think that as we look at the options with city council on the police station and we look at how that impacts the decision, because if you think about dominoes, the police station decision, we have to make that decision before we can really start digging into the library discussion. And the library discussion is going to greatly impact the parking decision. And so we sort of have to go through all of that process before we can really commit funding in a meaningful way. And so I think as we go through this process over the next few months I'm talking about, that project gets more clarity in terms of timing. But the point is uh, that that would be downtown also. Yes. be right in the same. That's right. Okay, so we've talked about already the um, DMV demolition. Um, if you don't need me to go talk about that any further, we'll skip right past it um, and go to city housing renovation. Um, I'm only going to highlight that project because that relates to the houses that the city owns that are now part of our workforce housing program mm -hmm. that's operated by the housing authority. And so traditionally we have budgeted in our CIP to do maintenance items. Uh, we're doing a lot of maintenance right now that the housing authority is carrying out for us on those properties and planning for some in the future. So that'll be an item that you'll continue to see in our CIP. Under uh, facilities and land, um, you've got the front window update inside City Hall. That's an important project for us because that's probably the most visited window in City Hall and it needs upgrade both for comfort of the people that are working at the station and also security. And so you can see that we've got some carryover money there dedicated to that. I think that project will kick off probably before the end of the fiscal year. Moving the Prince George parking garage to LED lighting. Um, one of the complaints that we do get about the parking garage is that it's dark. Um, and the LED lighting provides a different type of light. We've done this project along the road on Jamestown. No, I'm sorry, on Richmond Road. And we'll be doing it on Jamestown. And what we have found through our pre-lighting survey and our post-lighting survey is that, in fact, just switching from LEDs to LEDs improves the brightness on the street. So we're expecting the same kind of outcome in the garage. Well, I've had street fence replacement. Um, that's a project that we have planned. That's the street. That's the fence that's right here on Lafayette Street. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. if if you've paid attention to it, there's some damage to it. It's it's probably it time yeah. for it to get some attention. And so we've been having discussion with the residents of Harriet Tubman there um, mm -hmm. about what kind of fence they would like to see. 
Ultimately, I think we'll end up with a wooden fence that looks remarkably like that one um, because we don't want to lose sight of the fact that that fence was actually designed by Carl Navin. Um, so it's not a, it's not like we went to Lowe's and bought a pre-engineered no, fence product. So yeah. um, it'd be a shame to lose that mm -hmm. feature of downtown. Broadband assessment and development. That's a project that I'm really excited about. I, I don't know if you've heard us talk about this at all, but this is a GIO by the city council was to look at broadband implications inside the city. And really what we were driving at is the transatlantic connections that are occurring in Virginia Beach and those, those being expanded, as well as a new, what do they call it, fiber loop on the south side that's in development right now to take advantage of that product, all designed at increasing economic development potential. We don't want to be left behind. And if you look at the map for how that transatlantic cable will make its way into the rest of Virginia, it comes right through Williamsburg. One of the nodes for connection is William and Mary, which of course makes a lot of sense, right? So we don't want to lose the opportunity to capitalize on that. So I asked Mark in IT to begin working with a team on what we could do. And I didn't know what was possible. And in the end, uh, Mark and the team have found a potential vendor that could significantly reduce the cost of installing a broadband product in the city. And so we are right now using that team to explore the concept of a broadband loop that would offer Wi-Fi connectivity to the citizens, either through a private vendor or through a municipal vendor um, as part of our utility offering. And so it's an exciting project. We're really excited about what it means for the future of the city because if, you, if you're familiar with city government at all, you know that the trend in city government is what we call smart cities, which means more sensors, sensing everything, including when trash cans are full so that staff's not checking an empty trash can. And I know that seems simple, but the small efficiency associated with that is really important. You're talking about municipal trash cans, not homeowners' right. trash cans. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Watching watching. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get anybody right. stirred up uh, no, you're unnecessarily. Right. You're right. Our trash cans on the street. Yes. Um, <laughs> doing that means having the infrastructure to support that kind of bandwidth, mm. and so it's important that we're looking at it. Mm. I can't promise that we'll get where we want to go, but we're having a very meaningful and exciting conversation about it. And are your committee include people from William and Mary and their IT folks who are part of the snow that's coming through? It does not yet. Um, what we are doing here in the CIP, as you can see, there's a budget there. That budget is designed to hire the consultant that's doing the south side loop and as well as advising on the transatlantic connection. And once we've done that, they will help us put together a study plan that will include those folks. And I guess, I mean, just from having lived the generational changes of this, like when internet like first came to Lima Mary and Williamsburg, right? William & Mary was willing to put the first nodes into the communities right around William & Mary so that, like, if, if, as a faculty member, if I was willing to have a node, that would then extend William & Mary's coverage into my community, uh -huh. free access. Obviously, that was, like, a generation ago mm -hmm. in Internet service, and we now all have our, you know, whatever bill that comes in Cox, I guess it is. Um, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. Um, but, I mean, if, if they're... If, if well, William & Mary are actually part of this bigger project to bring it through William & Mary for our computing capabilities. They're probably going to once again try to expand their footprint, which means maybe the city doesn't have to do so much. So. Right. right. Absolutely. And, and you know, if you followed the, the Tourism Development Fund conversation, one of the applications we received was for Wi-Fi in Colonial Williamsburg, by Colonial Williamsburg. And, you know, all of that sort of linked together. You can also fold into that conversation the availability of 5G and how are we going to provide that service? Um, so we're meeting with the cellular providers to talk about that. There's a lot of overlap in this conversation. And, you know, there's no way to guarantee we won't make a false step and put in some infrastructure that in 10 years is irrelevant, um, like broadband, you know, if 5G can carry that load. I mean, these are all things way beyond my technical knowledge. And so we just want to make sure we're prepared. Hiring this consultant is the best way to stay on top of it. Website replacement, I know that that didn't really involve the Planning Commission, but it does in the fact that 
If you've used our website, you know it's not fantastic. And that's not a slide on our IT people. That's just the nature of a website. One of the most common complaints we get is it has too much information on it. <laughs> and, you know, okay, uh, I can see that point. It can be difficult to find what you're looking for because mm -hmm. of the volume that you're sifting through. Um, but we have a contract for that website, and that contract comes up, and so we're budgeting some money in case we decide to switch vendors. Let's see. <clears throat> Carolyn said, I did not need to talk about the vehicle replacement plan. <laughs> but we'll skip that one. <laughs> that brings us to facilities and the library renovations. So there's been an ongoing conversation about how we're going to handle the needs of the library moving forward. And for quite some time, we've had $60,000 here to every year assist us in review of options. And we've dipped into it a little bit, but most years it's gone unspent. And that's largely because the library board, which I'm a member of, and they were meeting across the hall, um, has been funding that process, working with their own consultant to talk about options. And there's been a, a community conversation, there was a community survey. Um, on the table are essentially two options. One would be to renovate, redo, reconstruct our library here in the city, or for the library system to build a third library somewhere in James City County. And those are the conversations that have to mature. They're not there yet in terms of making a decision. Of course, the city of Williamsburg knows which opportunity we would prefer, and that is to reconstruct a library here inside the city on the same footprint. Ideally, the, the police station is no longer there and doesn't present the hurdle of connecting in a meaningful way to Stryker Center, and we can take advantage of the entire site. Um, and so we've started budgeting a number to assist with that. And you can see that there. Impossible to know what that number will be at this point because the complexities there are numerous. I'll just give you the two easy ones. Number one, there's no design. And so with no design, how do you budget? Um, and then number two is what's the appropriate share of cost between James City County and the city? If we turn to the existing library contract, which is complex because it includes York County, we would go strictly by usage, discounting York's participation. And I don't know that that's fair because you're talking about a library building that arguably has an impact on the community that needs to be accounted for beyond usage. And so that's a conversation that has to mature over time. We're having those conversations and I think getting closer and closer to budgeting for a project. So. So that the operating cost share, which is the flow right. usage, that division is being seen as not separate from like the capital improvement of an infrastructure thing here in the city that's a driver of other economic activity and all that other stuff. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It would be helpful to have the Planning Commission's input on the importance you place on that project. I think keeping the library downtown is of utmost importance. Yeah. Yeah, I think we I think last year we'll say it. Yeah, yeah, I think that was clear in our earlier discussion of this yeah. that there was and I think that unanimity this, the, on this whole development of mm -hmm. a city center, town center, um, you know, as somebody who is at the library weekly, you know, there's always stuff that's going on down here and it is this broader economic development driver. And the possibility of being able to use the property next to us man, yeah. is really exciting. Okay. So, I mean, parking. good. Even if it's and it sounds like what you're saying is it's not just keeping the library downtown, but it's also take the opportunity to do something that's more of a landmark quality. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you may have read our minds, but yes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> not to put words in your mouth. Um, I mean, I would, go, I would go slightly further, which is to make the, which is to observe that we're, we're, there are a number of things on here tens of millions of dollars um, being proposed to be spent along Armistead, um, including, um, what have we listed, a new police station. Now, we talked about that potentially moving, but I want to put that in the mix, a new police station, a renovated fire station, um, 
uh, a new library or an improved library, a new parking deck. Um, and there have been discussions about, maybe this is on the economic development um, uh, authority side, about improving the connectivity of the transit center to the rest of town. I see all those things as right now discrete projects that would be, that the city would be better served if they were brought together uh, through a kind of master planning process that would articulate those relationships, make them clear, and make sure that there was a, a real vision for what is already our civic center, but a civic center that would be significantly, um, I'm going to say changed, we want to make sure that, that those changes constitute a significant improvement given the amount of uh, expenditure that we're talking about here. So some kind of vision for Armstead, uh, I think, is going to be, uh, I'm not going to say critical, mm -hmm. um, because I think these things could all do what they need to do without a kind of master plan for all that. But I think it would be much, much better for the city, especially given the amount of money that we're talking about spending, if that were all coordinated and um, planned out ahead of time. I, I acknowledge that developing a master plan for um, whether it's an Armistead Avenue master plan or a Civic Center master plan or whatever you want to call it, um, has the potential to slow down a couple of these projects a little bit uh, because we want to have that plan in place before we start spending money on a new police station or whatever. But I think it would be time very well spent. And if there's real urgency to one of these projects, then maybe that changes the calculus a little bit. Um, but it does seem to me that this is something that we should approach very, very deliberately. Um, and I'll just add as a sort of an important footnote, mindful of the modern history of Armistead Avenue, which right. is um, an urban renewal, uh, essentially an urban renewal part of town uh, that has involved displacement of people who maybe didn't want to be displaced um, 50 years ago or so. So. Um, You've shown us some things here, and I just I say all this because <laughs> I love the idea of a kind of signature building. I love the idea of a series of signature buildings. I love the idea of a really distinctive uh, kind of civic center to um, this area that we're talking about. But I also want to make sure that we do that in a both a strategic way and a way that's mindful of its history. Um, so I'll sit back. I think I think this time you read my mind, Mr. Glee. Oh, excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent. I would think we're all on that same page. I mean, the, the ability to sort of trade buildings uh, with the, if the police station goes away, and then we can shift and, and expand the library into that location and, and just trade those locations um, so that they're all working in concert. And I think it's just paramount to, to the success for a long range plan. Um, does the Blayton building play a role in that? I would think so. Um, and the land that's over there as well. Yeah. I guess what I would say is I think the, um, the, the function that the Blayton building serves is essential. And my feeling, and I think probably we should have a discussion about this, maybe not at this moment, but my feeling is that that function should remain where it is. Um, whether that very building is the right building to, to do that function in the long term, I think is something that needs to be discussed and needs to be discussed with the housing authority and I think some of the residents of that building as well. <coughs> but um, I can well imagine um, a, a really robust civic center that included housing as well as these other functions that we're talking about and all those things sort of working together visually, I think working together programmatically, um, potentially working together as a route for people using the transit center to get to campus and to get to Merchant Square. Um, but to figure all that out will require some real vision um, and some real skill and some sensitivity both to the, um, the, the, the architecture of this community but also the, the fabric of this community, the people in this community and their 20th century history and 21st century history I guess now. Right. But yes, I think is a short answer for, for me. Okay. I agree. The Bladen building, more essential, something like that, should be continue in the same place. Yeah, I agree. Historic. And, and I'm not married to it staying in the same place. I think the same proximity, uh, so that it's 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 close to downtown. But that that seems, from my perspective, to be um, in the middle of a very tourist section. Uh, to to me and. It doesn't have to be right there. It can be close so that it's still 
uh, walkable and, and such, but if, if you've got the pedestrian people walking down Prince George Street and such, um, uh, going down to the delis and all that, it just seems like an, an odd thing to have along that path. Right. Um, Part of the reason it feels odd is because it's historically an African-American neighborhood that was largely gutted in the 1960s. And this is sort of the last, this and, I mean, I think if you want to consider Braxton Court as a piece of that, are two of the last remnants of that. Uh, community and to sort of for now what would be the third time push them away to someplace else not necessarily their choosing I think um, uh, that's not something I would support I'll, I guess I'll put it that way so maybe if it moves slightly um, fine I think better use of the property that's available and, and because there's a lot of property, property there there's a lot of property there mm -hmm. a lot of property there that's sort of in the middle of downtown um, and, and I know the, the economic development uh, consultant um, had sort of identified that huh? as, as uh, available for uh, a few other functions. I think there are a lot of things in that report that don't necessarily reflect reality on the ground sure. in, a, in a thoughtful way. Um, and that's, to me, one of them. I don't think that needs to be the place for a new high-end grocery store, which is I think oh, great. sort of pegged for that site. So I just, as I say, as we master plan, well, I would like to see us master plan um, this civic center, but also to do so in a way that is attentive to uh, the modern history of that, of the sure. street. Yeah. Okay, great. With new sidewalks, because they're really <laughs> skinny sidewalks along the back end of the library. <laughs> it's hard to walk there. That's good. I see Carolyn is writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, think, I think she wrote fatter sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so good. So then that brings us to um, sort of <laughs> at the bottom of that page, percent for the art. Percent for art, yes. Yeah. So uh, hopefully you saw my presentation to council last month about public art as a program. Um, one of the GIOs that the council put before us was to come up with a plan for public art that better organized our process than we have now. And so what we did is we just basically looked at it from the standpoint of murals, which led the conversation because we have actually had interest in murals and we don't have a vehicle to approve them right now. Um, so I did some research, looked around at other communities and came up with a process for both murals. And what I found was as I, as I looked at that, it didn't make sense to come up with a process and implement a process that just was for murals because the process in use in most localities for public art was the same. And so at, at, during that conversation with council, we expanded the concept beyond murals to just be public art. And so when we think about public art, we think about murals, of course, but also the art that surrounds the Stryker Center, the art that's in Bicentennial Park. All of that is public art, and we need a better process for not only selecting what it is, but also selecting the site where it's installed. And so we've presented that to council, and along with that, we have said, it's great to have a process, but we really need to marry it with funding if it's gonna be meaningful. And the council, I think, embraced the idea of funding for the arts. There was a lot of discussion on where that funding should come from. I do not think there's consensus on it coming from the CIP alone. There was a lot of discussion about public art as a function of tourism and could there be some money from the, our tourism development fund to act as seed money so that the CIP doesn't bear that burden alone. Um, and then there was a lot of conversation about what does it mean to have a percent designated for the art? Um, are you bound to provide that 1% every year? And if you're not bound, then is it really a commitment? And I don't have good answers to any of those questions outside of saying that in most localities where you have a percent commitment, whether it's a percent of the CIP, a percent of public building projects, a percent of building permit revenue, those are all three examples of funding for public art you would find in other localities. When the budget gets tight, as it can in one year or another, that's one of the sources you go to first. And so if we're doing it, in my opinion, properly, we've funded it sufficiently in the, the happy years, in the good years, in the easy years of budgeting, so that when the lean years come, it's not 
devastating to the art program. And so I think that part of why I have built this the way that I have is so that we're building up a decent cache of money so that in those lean years, which are certainly out there, it's not devastating to the program. Um, and as far as the community is concerned, it continues on even in those years where maybe it's not funded 100%. As so I think as this matures, we're going to see this conversation change and the source of funds, while it's shown here as CIP, changing considerably as the council decides on how best to proceed. Um, but I do think it's a major step forward for us. A lot of communities have had an art program that's funded for a, a long time, and it's time that we match that. I, I think it's a really nice idea. I, the one thing that I noticed, this is a small point, but is the wide fluctuation in the number from one year to the next. And so one year you can get a, you know, Carrara marble or something, and then the next year it's, you know, corrugated metal or something. So <laughs> one way to kind of even that out um, is, to, is to use a, a, a rolling, a trailing 13 quarter average or something to sort of say, it's not just this year, it's 1%, it's one. It's the average 1% of the last 13 quarters, and then so okay. these wide swings that's a good idea. get a little tighter, uh, just to help with planning. Sure, that's a good idea. Absolutely. And I think the theory behind the 1% matching, in a lot of places that 1% is 1% of public building construction. Uh, and the right. theory there is, well, you build a new building and you spend right. all these millions of dollars, but you don't budget to beautify it, so you right. just end up with a building. Right. And so if you match it that way, then you've got funding to do the art associated with it. We also just make it a beautiful building. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Maybe the building itself is art. Yeah. No, I think it's great. However it's however it, you know, is calculated. And and a different take on how it's being calculated. I mean you keep on using one percent, but like the first number of fifty two thousand isn't one percent of that I'm seeing it's like 1.8 of percent of the subtotal or if, I mean is it are you really saying this is 1% of something or yes this, this year's carry I did not do the math madam chair but it should be that that 1% is 1% of our total CIP expenditure that's the intent So when we ran the numbers for last fiscal year, we spent about $60.5 million, so it was $165,000 for public art. As I say, I don't know that that's what the council will agree to in the end, and we may end up with a different proposal from the staff, but right now we're, we're putting it in to hold the place. Yeah, I know, I know. I think, I think the 1% think is a, a great idea, um, and I think the idea that it is also something that, in the best of all worlds, buys these funds to do public good, but if we have, when we have a recession at some point, then overall fiscal solvency okay. Right. So then that brings us to the, the final page of the, our municipal capital plan, and that, and that what, what that shows you is sort of the balances, and as you can see, those balances are pretty healthy at the end of each June 30th. Um, important to note that this reflects that change I talked about at the beginning of the meeting where we separated out the funds. And so this is not meant to make people be overly concerned, but we do want to show you that, you know, the, the effect of these projects on that available fund balance for the CIP projects and what happens when you start folding in the school projects on top of it. Um, so if what's illustrating here is the draw on the reserve in the CIP and what that means for future years. And so hopefully what we're, what we're hoping is this helps us sort of contextualize the conversation about when projects should be planned. Because historically there has not been a great conversation about timing of projects and we think that that's important for the health of the fund. So I hope that this will make it a little easier for people to see the impact of, well, if we put it in this year, this is what it does to fund balance as opposed to moving it out a year. Um, so it'll, I think, aid us in the conversation about importance more than we've had in the past. And then the final page is folding in the school projects. 
And you can see there that what we've done is, I think, provide much more clarity in how the city invests in the projects that are envisioned for the school system because we split out their projects where it used to just be one line. Now you've got an entire sheet that shows you the, the, those big spending projects. So you can see new school construction very easily and what our 10% share of that is. Um, and then down at the bottom, you can see again how that impacts those fund balances. And sort of extract from that what the needs are gonna be for new revenue. This is relevant particularly as if you followed last year's discussion and already this year's discussion on timing of school projects. This is where you can see the impact of moving a project one year or another is pretty significant as it relates to the rest of the capital plan. So, you know, ideally we take advantage of the enrollment projections so that we time those projects in a way that we minimize the need for new revenue to fund the whole wish list of projects. And all of this keeps the 35%. Yes, so what's not shown there, I thank you for asking that question. It used to show you the 35% calculation at the bottom there, and we don't do that anymore because the 35% is no longer in this fund. Yeah. It's in the general fund. Yeah. So you can rest assured the 35% is over there. I think, um, I'm going to get this wrong, so I probably shouldn't say it. But I think we were at about 39 and some change percent in the general fund reserve at the close of the year. But, I mean, that's critical not only for our solvency if we have a significant downturn um, in the future, but also with some of these years where we're in the deficit, if we do need to float bonds, then our bond rating is going to be that much more improved because of our fiscal solvency. That's right. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's a delicate dance in terms of our bond rating um, because, you know, to to use a, a term that I like, we're boxing outside of our weight class in terms of our debt rating right now. I mean, we have the debt rating of a much larger municipality, and it's largely because we have managed debt so well, in addition to managing our uh, reserve well. And so we don't want to do anything to jeopardize either one of those calculations, because I think that while, I think that that debt rating is a source of pride, Certainly for those of us that are government wonks, um, uh, but even I think for the community, if they really understood what it meant, that should be something that we're very proud of. And that's not a credit to me, certainly. That's a credit to the, the city managers that have come before and the city councils that have come before for managing the city as well as they have. Well, I, th I, I mean, I think that happy and grateful of our fiscal health. Yes. And I think that if we're thinking about some of these major projects, like some of the things that are coming in front of tourism development, our fiscal health with regard to our bond rating is going to be right. Making that be a positive. Absolutely, and that's part of our job in educating the city council on: okay, you want to do this entire list of projects, and and their their landmark, their signature, um, they would be great. We need to have a conversation about how that impacts the fiscal health of the city so that we're making that smart decision. And the city does that not through my advice, although I do provide what I can. It, we have a fiscal advisor, Davenport, that comes in and looks at the whole portfolio and then advises the council independently of the staff. And I think that that's important so that they can see from what Davenport brings to the table is an awareness of fiscal properties of cities all over the state because they manage the fiscal health of most of the localities. And so when they come and present, they're presenting, here's how you compare to all of your colleagues. And I, I think that's an important review. Um, so thank you, Andrew. That was a fantastic lesson on all of this. <laughs> uh, I know we've been asking questions as we've been going along, but does anyone have any other questions? We had a study that 
was in the CIP number town, but the expanding Cedar Grove. Ah, uh, yes. Has that been accomplished or dropped off? Um, the study has dropped off, um, but it's a GIO for the city staff. And, you know, the limiter there is less about can we expand it? It's a matter of are the surrounding property owners willing to allow us to, right? Because ultimately we've got to buy property to expand it. And I think we've already identified what that expansion would be in terms of space. But um, we're talking with William & Mary, who's the landowner, to see if they have a willingness. We've opened that conversation. We've not completed it. I think initially there is some willingness there. Um, so we're moving that forward. As I say, it's a GIO. We hope to have some, some form of conclusion to that discussion uh, before November. Agenda says that we have an open forum, so I, I, your presentation. I am. Is, Thank is, you. I'm sorry. It was. I'm sorry. It was a lecture. No, but no. It I was, really I, enjoyed I, I, no, the I really, conversation. I personally really appreciated your going through it all and Definitely. allowing us to discuss things as we were upon them. I think we really had a great discussion and a great. I really appreciate that. Perfect. Um, but there is somebody here in the audience. I did want to open the open forum uh, to allow you to come forward to speak. Um, not seeing any desire for that, but I wanted to fulfill my obligation on that. But thank you um, here. So um, is the, the end result of this work session for us um, are takeaways for Carolyn to have with regard to getting a draft of a letter put together before our next public hearing so that we can finalize that. I can sign that to send back to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so... Um, Obviously, Carolyn's been there taking notes as we can go. Yeah, I've tomorrow. taken notes. Why don't I just draft up a rough draft of that and send it to everyone, and then you can add your comments to it, and we can go from there. That, that works for me. I mean, so great. The, the notes that people have been making as they've been going through the past hour and a half, if you keep them, see sure. Carolyn's draft, so that if you, like, oh, well, I actually thought that five-minute conversation we had should have actually been a bullet point, we can add that, mm -hmm. but that would be right. perfectly good for Right. Me. I've starred things that I mm -hmm. took. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I, I would rather not try to write by committee a letter at this junction right. of the evening. And there's sure. <laughs> the things in last year's letter that need to be reiterated. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Stuff from last, last year's letter. Last year's letter is a template for the letter moving forward and then the discussion that we're having. Yeah. So I'm happy to do that and I'll send it out to everyone and then you can tweak that and then we can. We also have a meeting next Wednesday work session. So if it needs to be, we can put that at the end of the agenda and oh that would be fantastic versus us just right. seeing the draft at the um, right. hearing yeah right. so that, that was the other uh, piece of sort of putting information so I wanted to just raise that so we are meeting next week at the same time our work session time four o'clock and we will be looking at um, the commercial and economic development which is spot on to a lot of what we discussed today yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And, and if you have the draft that's fine if, if not then we'll just move forward I know that you have other things on your so are there any other 